It's been a slow start for Oregon State football, who is looking to turn things around in the second half of the season. But this week, they're searching for their first Pac-12 win of the year against one of the best teams in the conference, the USC Trojans. Darnold keeps. Darnold scores. Some of USC's most stunning losses have come at the hands of the Beavers. It's knocked down, and the Beavers are going to win. What will it take for another historic upset? That's ahead on a brand new edition of Go Beavs. The Beavers settling into sunny Southern California as they get set to take on the 14th ranked USC Trojans. The Trojans cannot be happy after that upset to Washington State last week. Welcome into Go Beavs in our beautiful new home uh, on NBC Sports Northwest. Jason John Baptiste, Lindsay Schnell. Uh, lots of questions for the Beavs this week. Will we see Ryan Null? What will happen if we don't see him? USC also dealing with a ton of injuries. We're going to talk about both of those later in the show. Uh, but first, USC very hungry for a win. Oregon State desperate for a win. Absolutely. What do you anticipate happening this weekend? I'll tell you what, and we talked about this last week. I thought the worst thing that could have happened for Oregon State was Washington State beating USC because now USC is in a really bad mood and they're yeah. going to want to take that out on someone. Yeah. And here comes Oregon State into the Coliseum. Yeah, they're, they're going to be very angry and for good reason. You know, traveling on Pullman and not being able to pull that out. Um, and Oregon State for Oregon State side. I mean, they should be pretty mad as well. I mean, you know, they didn't have a very good uh, day against Washington on Saturday. The defense played really well in the first half. Second half, they came out. They didn't play nearly as well. Offense didn't even move the ball past the 45-yard line. Washington's 45-yard line until, uh, you know, late into the fourth quarter. So um, it's not looking too good for them, I think. I mean, like you mentioned, Jason, I mean, it really seemed like the defense and they it just they were firing all, on all cylinders in that first half. What was sure. the difference between the first and the second half for you in that game? But also this is something we've been seeing all season, the second half drop off. Yeah, I, I think what ends up happening is that they end up getting tired, you know, and, and uh, we've talked about this before. Oregon State doesn't have a lot of depth uh, anywhere on the field. Mm -hmm. So when you play really well in the first half and in the second half, you're on the, on the field majority of the time, which they were, against Washington in the second half. I mean, you're going to get tired out, and they're going to be able to run the ball a little bit better. They're going to be able to pass the ball on you. So I think they just got tired. And uh, not only that, but I also think that the coaching staff didn't really make some adjustments that could have helped put them in a better position to make plays um, either. So uh, the combination of those two things really didn't help them at all in the second half. Yeah, they had a really good first punch, and Jake Browning talked about that. He said that he thought that you could tell that OSU was coming off a bye week because they looked fresh they were throwing some stuff at them that they didn't anticipate but then in the second half you uh, excuse me Washington figured it out settled in and played like a playoff team yeah well as for the offense Daryl Gerritsen starting at quarterback last week with Jake Luton still dealing with that thoracic spine injury here's what he had to say about jumping in behind center you know as far as my performance obviously there's things that I could do better but um, I played all right um, in my opinion not where I wanted to play but uh, we just got to get better. Uh, we got to get better in all phases of the game. Uh, up front, quarterback spot, everywhere else, we just got to play better. So um, whatever we got to do to make those changes, we'll make it. Darrell, in terms of the Washington game, was the game plan kind of for you guys to stick to more of a ground approach rather than, you know, you guys stretch the ball vertically as you guys only threw it a couple times downfield? Yeah, I mean, you guys you guys saw the game. So uh, obviously we thought we could uh, we could run the ball a little bit and, and maybe create some momentum there. and. Uh, you know, what happened in the game is what happened, so uh, we just got to move on from there and learn from our mistakes. Yeah, it seemed even in the first half, I mean, this offense struggled to find any sort of consistency, wow. rhythm. Yeah, and it's something we're going to talk about a little bit later with Jason breaking down the really the rushing attack, but how did you feel about Daryl Garrettson seeing him in game action well, this year? He didn't turn the ball over. Yeah, he didn't talk, turn the ball over. Which was a key. We, yeah, we well, threw out their well, last It was, last was week. a key to ingredients. Yeah, it was, it was work. They didn't win, but... <laughs> but here's the thing is that, like, you know, so there's a couple things there. Like, Daryl doesn't have, and we've talked about this before, Daryl doesn't have the type of arm that Jake does. We all know that, right? But 
That being the case, you can't have dropped passes either. And on a number of occasions, he put the ball where it needed to be, and the receivers just didn't catch the ball. That has nothing to do with him. You know, that has all uh, to do like with the receivers and the ability to catch the ball and do something with it. So when you have drop passes and you're not able to really throw the ball down the field like you want to, I mean, it, it's a it's a bad situation all the way around. So. And when and when you can't do that and you can't get Ryan Nall going, what do we say? His his longest run was five yards. His longest right. run was five yards, and uh, you know, quite quite frankly, um, the offense has been anemic. I mean, when you're not able to move the ball past the 40, your opponent's 45-yard line, right, all the way uh, going into the, the start of the fourth quarter, then that to me tells me that uh, the offense has major issues. I do think we need to kind of get some perspective here. Like, number one, Oregon State is a bad football team. I think you could actually make an argument that they are the worst Power 5 team in the country right now. So they're going to struggle That's a strong, against, that's a strong I mean, it's them or Missouri, probably. So they're going to struggle against a lot of good teams. Washington, by contrast, is one of the top teams in the country. A lot of people are not going to be able to do things against them. And my biggest thing is we need to see them put together a full game, right? Sure. And Ev talked about that on Wednesday. But the fact that they did play pretty well in the first half, I know that most of it was defensively, but those are building blocks. Like we talked about, it. it's going to have to kind of be about small victories. You see, uh, and here, here's my thing with that, is that... You disagree. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I, 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 quite frankly, I, I kind of strongly disagree because it's not like Oregon State doesn't have talent. They have talent on that offensive side, on the offensive, uh, offensive side of the ball. As a matter of fact, in the beginning of the year, we were talking about how they might have one of the best running back combinations in the whole country. So to go from there in the beginning of the year to now going to where we're saying, oh, they're you know one of the worst teams in the NCAA, uh, to me, tells me that, yeah, may, they might have some struggles, but uh, coaching comes into that as well, too. Player development comes into that as well. So, you think I'm, they're not one of the worst teams in, NCAA, in Power 5? The way that they're of or the? No, 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 the no, difference, the, right? teams that are worse yeah, than them. The, the, they're, they're one of. Um, <laughs> I, I think the way that they're playing right now, you know, proves that. But that said, I don't think they are one of the, uh, you know, one of the... They don't have, they have the talent on the roster that they should be that they shouldn't be that is what you're saying exactly i mean exactly. there's still there's still a lot of time left in the season but you are who you are you the players you have healthy are who you have so what do you do in that situation do you just shake things up again i know we've talked about coaching you don't anticipate any coaching changes i know there's been again some some talk out in the media and whatnot about bringing in an offensive consultant i mean how do they how do they salvage things? How do they actually turn things around, particularly well, on the offensive end? Well, I think it's what we talked about with young kids. You have yeah. young kids, reps, see if they can grow. You know, I do think that in the last few weeks, and I think I feel like we've seen this a little bit more on the defensive side of the ball, but it's kind of like, hey, if you can play, we're going to put you in. You know, they're not going to be loyal to upperclassmen. I agree wholeheartedly. Good. I agree wholeheartedly. And, and part of the thing, you know, as a foreign player myself, is where's that fire in the belly? Like, where, where's the you know, being pissed off and, you know, like not letting people just walk all over you. I mean, you know, week in and week out, this team has, you know, been dominated. You know, when is it going to come to an end or come to a point in time where the players are like, you know what, like enough is enough. And in the first half, defensively, it was there. You know, they, you're, you're playing against one of the top teams uh, in the country and they shut them down. Right. So. Right. All right. A little later in the show, we're discussing Thomas Tyner's return from injury and what this means for the running backs going forward. Plus, Clay Hilton talking to Sam Darnold. Everybody sees the physical traits uh, and the, the physical skills, but what I appreciate as a coach is his intangibles and, and how he leads our football team. Well, Reeser Stadium has recently been built up. It's beautiful. They have a record crowd in the house. Their team is surging. They're hoping to catch the Trojans a little flat. Straight back forward. Todd throws in Change here today. Went out. 
What's left? Takes drive, fires in the end zone. Almost intercepted. The caught for a touchdown. James Rogers on the carry. Let's get this thing moving. CJ Gable in the ball game. High throw, intercepted. Greg Laborn. Weaves his way toward the end zone, brought down at the two. They give it to Quiz. And the freshman scores. And the Beavers. Gonna shake up the BCS race. So there will be a humongous party in Fort Dallas tonight. The Beavers spring a trap and shock the college football world. Well, Beavers fans love reliving those games. 77th meeting between the two schools. USC holding the 61 11 in four edge. USC has beaten Oregon State 23 straight times in Los Angeles. Time now for a little historical perspective with Mike Parker. We're bringing him in from Corvallis. Uh, Mike, looking at the series throughout the years, why has this been so lopsided? Well, normally, I mean, primarily, USC through the years has a lot better football players and have been nationally ranked number one in the country in a lot of those years that the Beavers have played USC in Los Angeles and played them in Corvallis. Even the 1967 game that the Beavers won three to nothing and defeated OJ and company, there were five first round draft picks and the number one overall draft pick on that team for USC at Parker Stadium that day. And since the Beavers last beat USC in 1960, Tommy Prothrow with a 14 to nothing win in the season opener over John McKay's Trojans in his first game at USC. The Beavers, generally speaking, have gone up against juggernaut teams that have outscored the Beavers by an average of 38 to 10 in the 23 consecutive seasons. So it's just been primarily a factor of dealing with better football teams. So now we are we're approaching the 50th anniversary of the Giant Killers game. I know they're going to be in Corvallis next weekend. Uh, probably a perfect time for maybe an upset, a little David versus Goliath this weekend. Absolutely. We know how that one came out, too, don't we? And that's kind of how this one set up with the Beavers playing USC as a heavy underdog. But you're right. The Giant Killers are coming back to Corvallis. They'll be honored during the Colorado game next week and there would be no better way to bring the giant killers back than perhaps this current Oregon State team knocking off in the historical matchup maybe as big of a giant as the Beavers have ever faced by the comparison of where they are and where USC is right now it would be the perfect way to welcome back those 1967 legendary players. Sam Darnold does just about everything right. This is a baller. He's got the it factor, though. When, when his team needs a play, he's always the one that comes up with it. Darnold pressure. Sam Darnold making some magic happen. Working inside the five-yard line. I mean, this is an elite combination of size, athleticism, and arm strength. Darnold keeps. Darnold scores. Whatever that it factor is. And Mike's going to join us a little later in the show. A closer look at USC star quarterback in our Toyota of Portland opponent preview. And a big thing about these numbers, take a look at the touchdown to interception ratio. Just nine interceptions all of 2016. He already has eight. Big difference. Here is the other conference's star QBs on Darnold. Yeah, I mean, I got to know him pretty well. I think he's personality-wise, someone I get along with. And, uh... You know, yeah, obviously I had a good career so far, and you know, we'll see we'll see what happens this year. But been accurate, makes stuff happen outside of the pocket, uh, played well against us and, and beat us. You know, I always focus on you know the release, always trying to touch that up a little bit, um, just get better in that area. He's he's not just a quarterback. Um, he, I mean, he throws the ball incredibly well, but uh, he, he can run the ball too. He's athletic and uh, you get the job done through the air or on the ground. I think I had a tendency to make the hard throws look easy and the easy throws look hard. Um, so I think that really comes from just, you know, keeping my base um, really consistent. Um, and I think just, you know, staying with my reads and not being so quick to scramble, maybe. Um, those are some of the things that I noticed and that I can obviously get better at. 
Well, Darnold's not having quite the season that everyone expected. There was a major hype at the start of the year around this kid. What are you what noticing you as, as, absolutely, I mean, he's a great quarterback, but what are you noticing as the season goes on? Well, he said it himself. He has a tendency to make the really hard plays look easy. We saw that especially in the Texas, in the overtime win over Texas. And then the easy plays look challenging. It's like sometimes he doesn't want to just take the easy out or do the easy check down. He wants to make sometimes this circus type throw and it yeah. doesn't end well for him. Yeah, and I think being that he has such a lively arm and is able to make all the different types of throws, sometimes, you know, he wants to test his limits a little bit. <laughs> see, oh, I think I could fit it in there. Let me just, oh, right. whatever, yeah. So I think that's the reason. Why, but with him, because of his talent level and how much talent he has, a lot of times you get the, the, the very best, but you also get certain plays where, you know, he shouldn't have done that throw and ends up getting intercepted. So, but he's a, he's a phenomenal quarterback, though. I think it's worth pointing out that USC is missing their starting tight end right yes. now. That's been huge for them. He's kind of similar to how Noah like Togiai can be a safety valve for OSU over the top. Uh, same with that. They Last week against Washington State, they only attempted a pass to a tight end twice. They didn't complete any. T. Martin, the offensive coordinator at USC, has fallen under quite a bit of fire. If you look through their statistics from each game, it's like getting a little bit worse, a little bit worse, a little bit worse. Yeah. But they're so beat up right now that that's really hurting yeah. them. 25 people on the injury report this week for USC. And obviously a huge part of that offense. I mean, it's, it's three major D linemen. Uh, you're taking a look at kind of the, the key guys that are out, including that right guard. I'm not even going to attempt to say their names because I will just Nathan mess them up. Smith, we but can I'll handle. tell you yeah. that they are very important. Yeah. Um, but Lindsay, I mean, as something you brought up on Wednesday's show, I mean, when you're at a program like USC, does it really matter? One five-star gets hurt, yeah. and you bring another one in off the bench. No, definitely the, the talent, but there's no substitute for experience. You know, sure. it's very rare that we see anyone, as we just saw those highlights of Quiz lighting it up as a true freshman, it's very rare that you see someone come in who doesn't have game experience that can adapt really easily. Uh, you know, especially in some of, you know, like last week when SC was getting beat up at Washington State and they're bringing people in. Well, that's a tough game, tough environment, much better and easier yeah. to do when you're back home in the Coliseum. So, you know, yeah. even if USC's down to like its third stringer, it's, they probably still have the advantage over Oregon State from a recruiting star ranking yeah. point of view. And, and the thing is with the uh, uh, offensive linemen is that the centers are is the person who's dictating and song, you know, you get him, you get him. So if you have, and uh, their center is healthy. So if you have a, you know, right now you have the right guard who's a, a freshman. He's, this is going to be his first career True start. Freshman. True freshman. True <laughs> freshman. Um, as a young guy. As a young guy. But you know what? Uh, you know, it's helpful that you have other guys, you know, that are helping you. And like I said, the center is going to be the person, you know, telling him, okay, this is who you have. Or if he has any questions, he has someone that could help him. Um, not the same if you're playing quarterback position and you're a true freshman. So playing offensive line and being a freshman, I think he'll, he'll be okay. So I don't know if you're a D lineman, a veteran D lineman. Are you just going at like that guy? Oh, like, absolutely. Are you just, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, because you, here you have someone who's unproven, who hasn't started at all. I mean, he's a, you know, a true freshman at that. So you would think that there would be a noticeable difference in, you know, the size, the speed, all that. If I'm a D lineman, I'm looking forward to going up against him. <laughs> all right. Much more to come here on Go Beavs, including a revisit to our best damn bracket. Who wins the matchup between Brandon Cooks and Mike Hass? And up next, a look at the top stories of the week with Lindsay. Time now for our standard TV and appliance headlines with our veteran reporter of USA Today, Lindsay Schnell. And we're starting with women's basketball, right? Yeah, well, keeping with, the, keeping with the pro <laughs> basketball theme as we were just talking about the Blazers, Sydney Weiss just finished up her first pro season with the WNBA's Los Angeles Sparks. Now, the Sparks lost Wednesday night uh, at Minnesota in the WNBA Finals. They were the defending champs, lost in five games, very close. But Sid had a great year. She did not play in the playoffs, really, but she came off the bench in 28 games for the Sparks this season, averaged about eight minutes off the bench. Especially impressive because her coach, Brian Agler, is known to not play rookies. But great first year for Sid with the defending champs. She's going to head to Australia soon. But of course, this girl who loves to be in the gym Thursday night, Amanda, she posted a video on her Instagram of her getting shots up. Well, and what I think is crazy, I don't think a lot of people realize, once the WNBA season ends, I mean, these girls, I mean, they're they're on a plane like seven days later, right? You typically have seven days to get from wherever WNBA city you're in to your foreign city. And that does, and it doesn't matter if you have to go home, like for yeah. Sid, home in yeah. Phoenix. 
first. So it's chaotic. I actually talked today to Kelsey Plum, who's over in Turkey already. Wow, that's impressive. All right, number two, speaking of Washington, Chris Peterson. Yes, Chris Peterson, unhappy and voicing that displeasure this week. We all know that in the Pac-12, if you play on the Pac-12 network in particular, you're probably going to be kicking off late. And Chris Peterson will not have any more of it. He was very angry after the Huskies were given back-to-back 7.45 kickoffs. He apologized to the fans for his late games, saying, we want to play at 1 o'clock. I just want to say, as a reporter, when you play at 1 o'clock, it kills your entire day. That is true. That is very true. <laughs> so the late kicks are sometimes okay with reporters. Um, but the most interesting thing to me that Peterson said is he said, the conference doesn't care about our input. But he pointed out that no one back east is being able to watch the Huskies. And you know, Amanda, this is, this is the reason why Christian McCaffrey did not win the Heisman a couple years ago. Because Stanford's kicking off back east when everyone's asleep. Interesting. And then third, Beavers basketball getting somebody. Yes, we're looking for good news, right? If you're in Beaver Nation, well, we got some for you, okay? Beavers picked up a commit from Warren Washington, a 6'9", 180-pound post player out of California. He visited over the weekend, last weekend uh, for UW and picked them over Cal. Butler was the program that stood out to me the most. It's been a really successful mid-major, so to keep him local. He joins one other commit, Jack Wilson, a 6'11", 250-pound center, also from California. So this is good, just starting to get, need a lot of bodies, need a lot of Absolutely. depth, and need a lot of height. <laughs> All right, back here with more football in just a minute. But first, Evanston is getting ready for the weekend's game at the OSU Beaver Store. Hey guys, we're here at the OSU Beer Store on campus. We're at the hat wall, and I got my dad hat on. Check this out right here, the gray, the steel gray beaver logo, the OSU logo on the back. Then we have the camo hat, look at that. Can't go wrong with that. You know, OSU fans love the camo look. And then we got the trucker hat. Love it with the washed out gray look, the orange snapback. Get all your gear and more at the OSU Beaver Store. Fan star gear. Welcome back. Still to come on the show, what's the latest for the running back crew looking a little depleted due to injuries against Washington, and we're working to crown the best player in Oregon State history. Plus, we're handing out our ingredients to victory for the Beavers as they get ready to face the Trojans. Uh, hard to pinpoint just one part of the USC offense that will make them difficult, but no doubt a receiver, Deontay Burnett, is their stud in the passing game. So what do we know about him? How good is he? Oh, uh, he's... Jason has some troubling stats. Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> and, and, Receivers against the Oregon and, and the sad fact is that, you know, Deontay is like one of the better receivers. I mean, to me, I think he has the, the most short-handed hands, pair, um, pair of hands in the, in the league. So check this out. So in all the games that the Oregon State defense has played against so far, five games, here are the stats. So against Colorado State, Gallup, who's their number one uh, receiver, had 11 receptions, 134 yards. 11 receptions, 134 yards. Okay. Against Portland State, Crot had three receptions, 82 yards, but two touchdowns. Two, <laughs> two touchdowns. Against Minnesota, you have Johnson, four receptions, 127 yards, Ooh. a touchdown. And then against UW, Pettis had 12 receptions, three touchdowns, 105 oh. yards. So something tells me that Deontay is probably looking <laughs> at his chocolate right now. He's probably going to have a pretty good game. Yeah, 39 catches so far for 507 yards, five touchdowns. So he's yeah. been pretty good this season. Yeah. Uh, have you seen, well, this is probably, I probably know the answer to this already. What's going on in the Beaver secondary? I mean, have you seen any progress with some of these young guys? Because I know, I mean, again, we've got David Morris back there. He's a youngin. I think they've got some others that are pretty young. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, here's the thing for me is that, you know, it seems to me, and, and you know, I was talking to uh, one of my good friends, um, you know, this past week, who's a former player and a uh, former NFL player as well, too. And what he had he shared with me... Played in the me, secondary. <laughs> I, I played in the secondary. And, uh, and what he shared with me is that a lot of them look confused right now. Like, right. they're not, you know, sure as to where they should be. A lot of free people running around in the secondary. And, uh, you know, which, as you could tell just by the stats that I just read off, seems to be the case. I mean, right. there's no reason why one player should have 12 receptions in a given game. I'm sorry. There's no reason for that, especially when you know coming into the game that that's their number one target. And against uh, UW, everyone knew who the ball was going to when they were, when he Brown dropped back. It was, it was him, you know? So uh, th it's inexcusable, if you ask me. All right. One thing about SC, I just want to say, they have insane athletes. You know, that's part of why sure. Burnett's had so much success. 
SC's ability to recruit guys who can catch the ball and just take off is in, <laughs> is amazing. Yeah. But what's been most impressive is that they lost so much from the receiving core last year, and they again you just step in and replace. Recruit. And here's the other thing too is that Stephen Mitchell, who hasn't played the last two games, is coming back for this game. Just more. <laughs> just right, more. more. So it's going to be a lot of highlights. Uh, I don't know if. <laughs> Highlights or lowlights. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah. well, running back crew, it's all about Ronald Jones. Uh, here is the Trojans on what he brings to the table. He's unique in the sense that he he's really t difficult to tackle. He's got great balance, but as soon as he sees it and hits it, see ya. Well, he brings the home run hit. They, you know, every time he touches it, I hold my breath. Uh, he just, he's one of those guys that can go 80 with it at any point in time. Uh, extreme explosiveness. What I appreciate about Ronald is he's become a more complete player. You know, he, he was really a, uh, a runner in high school, but he's learning how to catch the ball out of the backfield, learning our pass protection. He's just kind of those, one of those crazy athletes that are like, how do you do some of the things that you do? It just doesn't make sense. He's like a He's like a stallion out there, but at the same time, he's got feet like a rabbit. So it's, I mean, he's just, he's a great back to have. And I think we got a lot of, a lot of diversity at the back, at the, at the running back position this year. So a stallion meets a rabbit. I don't know if either of you can top uh, that, that description, that description. Of Ronald Jones. Uh, I mean, it looked like in the last game, he still managed to find holes, even though the O-line guys were just going down. That's what you do if you're an SC running back, right? This is just, I mean, one in a long line of great backs yeah. at SC. Yeah. That's what they're known for. That's who they recruit. Those guys love to come in and prove that they can hang with those who have come before well, them. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you know, just, you know, kind of a la uh, Reggie Bush, where, I mean, the guy's, you know, super fast, super athletic. Um, he's more of a physical runner than Reggie Bush was, but, I mean, he just, he flies. I mean, he's, he's just, man, anytime he touches the ball, he could go the distance. So when you have a team that, okay, you got Sam Darnold, you have a great receiver, you have a pretty good running back, you know, you look at the, <laughs> where he's stuck, he stacks up in the Pac-12. Uh, how do you play this one? Do they, do they focus on stopping the run? Do they... Well, I think... you got to stop the run, right? Yeah, I was gonna say it's a lot run. easier to, like, theoretically for someone to run the ball than to catch, as we talked about, you yeah. know, Garrett's and dropping passes. So you always want to try to stop the run first. Well, and, and the thing is, is that where SC has struggled, as we uh, spoke about a little bit earlier, was in the turnover department, which has been their interceptions with Darnold. So if you stop the run and you force them to uh, throw the ball and you pressure Darnold, he will make mistakes. The, the hard part is being able to stop the run. Again, they have two injured linemen, so hopefully you would think that they would be able to stop the run. So if they're able to do that, then hopefully they pass the ball, make mistakes, and I mean, that's the best case scenario. All right, still to come, we're revealing our winner of our first round matchup in our damn best <laughs> bracket. And after the break, the latest on the Beavers running back injuries, will we see Thomas Tyner start for the Beavers? <laughs> here on Go Beavs, and we're taking a closer look at the Beavers' rushing attack, which uh, has been struggling over the past like weeks, right? Yeah, that like, is true. Like they're off, yeah. So what are you seeing from last week's game against Washington? Yeah, so there's two plays specifically that I want to show you, and they're both misdirection plays. And because of the lack of, you know, opportunities that they've had, I think misdirection is their best way in order to get the ball moving. So this first play here... What you'll see is that you have Null in a wildcat formation. He's going to take the snap here. He's going to do a little bit of misdirection here where he's going to fake the ball to him. And then what he's going to end up doing is he's going to, he's going to end up going right down the pike right here. But he ends up getting met by three or four different Washington Huskies. He actually ends up having his longest run of the day, which is five yards. Which kind of sums up your point. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. And, you know, unfortunately for them, uh, they're in a place right now where this is the best opportunity to actually get yards is through running people over because the linemen aren't able to sustain any blocks and aren't able to do anything. So, and again, this is exactly what I'm talking about in this second uh, view right here. This is, again, a misdirection play, but what you end up seeing here is that you're going to have AP come over here. And then you're going to have Nall take the, uh, take the ball, and he's going to end up bouncing get to the outside because there's no room for him to run on the inside. And again, he gets two yards, and then is met by two or three different 
Washington Huskies and doesn't really get anything after that. So well, and of course, when you when you look across the Pac-12, you know, you know, and Oregon State having trouble blocking. I mean, they're going up against some of the best D linemen in the country. What else can they be doing to maybe get th this going, you get know, going and help them sustain those blocks? Well, that's just I think schematically what you have to end up doing is you have to do more misdirection plays. Maybe you know have more uh, you know plays where you have no taking the snap and wildcat formation type of plays because if you're not able to do that then you're not able to really move the ball and they get beat i mean the guys aren't able to sustain any of their blocks so well, which is a big problem and potentially more bad news for the beavers this week as brian all was in a walking boot this week still unclear whether or not he'll play the good news is thomas tyner was back we're catching up with him in our busters barbecue q a um, it, it was fun for the most part, even though the game didn't uh, end like we wanted it to. It was, it was still fun uh, being able to get back in the swing of things and uh, be with the team. Is it still weird to you at all, Thomas, that you now play for the Beavers? Or are you totally used to it yet? Because I'm not sure the Duck fans are used to it yet. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm used to it. Uh, like The guys have done a great job of welcoming me. You know, I've been here for a while now, but I just feel like I've been here for a while, and uh, I think that's part of being a senior. But I think it's a lot of uh, the guys making it a team atmosphere, and I just love it here. So. Did you feel like your old self on Saturday for a stretch? Yeah, I felt, I felt fresh. Um, I'm back to my, my playing weight, 225, and that's why I ended up in the season out of Oregon. So uh, it's, it's pretty similar, I would say. Well, here's a look at the running back crew. Thomas Tyner, Tavoris Johnson, Art Pierce, Ryan Nall. Ryan Nall, like we said, uh, unsure if he's going to play this week. He was in a walking boot at practice. But Art Pierce, it sounds like he was up moving around, even though he came out of that last game and should be available for this weekend's game. Uh, like we've talked with Evanson, it seems like, you know, it doesn't really matter who starts necessarily at running back, but right. how do you, you know, if you don't have Nall, who does what? How do you kind of utilize those pieces? Well, I think mean, the first thing you have to do is that you have to go with the hot hand, you know, and, and uh, if last game was any indication, it seems like Tyner has the hot hand. So you ride that wave as long as you can, you know, and then you substitute and you work, you know, AP in there a little bit to get to the edges. But I think you have to start with a Tyner. He's the more physical runner. Uh, he's the one that had a decent game this last game. So you start off with him. As long as he's, his body could sustain the hits and uh, he could stay healthy, yeah, you just go with him. You ride that wave. It's interesting because I would actually argue that they're probably going to go to Pierce first because they, he's done more this season and he hasn't been banged up. But, you know, what Kevin McGiven talked about was, gosh, like everyone was talking about deep running back stable, deep running back stable. Now we can never get all of them healthy right? simultaneously. Yeah. Um, but big for Tyner, like we talked about, for him to have that type of experience, kind of get his mojo back a little bit. Maybe we see, maybe this is just the beginning. Yeah. I know you were at practice this week. What are we hearing about Nall? Um, if it's serious, anything? I mean, first of all, I just think that Ryan has been beat up for over a year. You know, that's the reality of the situation. What stinks is that having just come off a bye week, it's going to be a while before you get another break. Um, I would guess that he won't play, personally, right. although they have not announced that. All right, later in the show, we're revealing our ingredients to victory to a Beavers win over the Trojans. But first, who's jumping out to a lead in our best damn bracket? <laughs> Great Beavers coverage every week here on NBC Sports Northwest. Talking Beavs airs Wednesday at 7 p.m. Inside the Huddle Thursday at 9 p.m. And of course, Go Beavs Friday nights at 9 p.m. It's time now for our damn best bracket, where by the end of football season, we will be crowning the best football player in Oregon State history. Our first matchup was on the offensive end, Brandon Cooks versus Mike Haas. And our winner is Brandon Cooks. Oh, like my goodness. Sliver. Oh, my goodness. 52% to 48%. Jason is not oh, happy. Um, you you would have voted Mike. the other way, sorry, right? Mike. I absolutely would have gone the okay. other way. Because there, there's something about being the first person to do something. I, I, I just think that there is. Mike Haas was the first receiver to go three consecutive years with 1,000 yards receiving. Not saying that Brandon might not have done it. I mean, <laughs> Brandon might have done it had he stayed. I mean, he, he left after his junior year, but Mike was the first to ever do that. Not only that, he still holds the record for the most yards in a given game with 293 receiving yards in one game. Oh, man. In one game. So how, how do you not, not only that, he's also the first Fred Belitnikov Award winner most Oregon people don't know Belitnikov's first name. Good job. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think I knew it was Fred. I think that it's 
recency bias. That's a real Absolutely. thing. Okay. You Absolutely. know, and with what Brandon's doing in the NFL, Everybody's people, excited. you know, when we made this bracket, I don't think we talked about this on Wednesday, uh, Chad Johnson is not in our bracket, yeah. and it's because his accomplishments at Oregon State were pretty minimal compared to what he did in the NFL. That's, yeah. That's not to take anything away from what Brandon did at Oregon State, because it was incredible. The point that Ev made that I thought was a good one is he... Uh, and Cooks had he, Wheaton, yeah. and that made a big difference, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not at all surprised that Brandon won, you know, especially with younger fans. People <laughs> just can, love can him. Can I say something, too? Can I say something? So it helps Brandon when you have a mural, uh, uh, <laughs> like, like at, at the actual stadium. Mike has nothing, which, you know... <laughs> You it need is what it is. It is. I'm we just saying, yeah, he needs a lot. I mean, seriously, uh, that that does play into yeah. the character and play into yeah. the mentality of fans when they're voting for things like this. That is true. All right, we're going to take a look at our defensive matchup for the week. We're unveiling it now. It is going to be Nick Barnett versus Reggie Tung. And before we get these two opinion on it, Mike Parker is joining us to weigh in on who should be the winner. Well, thanks, Amanda. Wow, that's a great matchup right there because you have two players similar in nature in that they both play different positions at Oregon State. Reggie Tung came in as a safety, ended up playing both safety and corner. Reggie with four pick sixes in his career. Then he went on to play safety primarily and had a great career in the National Football League. Nick Barnett came in as a safety, converted a linebacker, back to safety, the, the safety, and then eventually an outstanding outside linebacker, one of the great tacklers and forces defensively in Oregon State history. And he, too, went on to a tremendous NFL career. This is one of the best and most compelling matchups in this bracket, in my opinion, in Oregon State football. And I'm glad I don't have to make the call as to who advances because they're both worthy, that's for sure. All right, here's a look at these two guys by the numbers. Nick Barnett, 2002, 121 tackles, ninth most for a single season, and then fourth most in a single season, 20.5 tackles for loss. Reggie Tung, second all-time in tackles, 362. First all-time interceptions for touchdowns. Three. I feel like Time out. Sad. Is Mike Parker not voting? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you might, you might Parker is Mike Parker. He has to tell, you know. No, Mike, log on to Facebook. He's we gotta need be your friends votes. with everybody. Okay, make the case for Nick Barnett. What are the pros of it? Well, well his I'm, career? I'm played, Jason I play. Jason is the defensive guy, so he's going yeah. to be making <laughs> the case for I'm, both I'm these all, people. Uh, I'm, I'm, I played with Nick. Okay. Uh, so to me, Nick. Uh, would win this just purely because you're just voting you... for your friend. No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not. I have personal experience with, with some of these players, and, and the one thing I can tell you about Nick is that first of all, he played during that Fiesta Bowl year that they won the Fiesta Bowl, which uh, is still the greatest year that uh, Oregon State football has ever had. Uh, he was a freshman that year. He came back and then he started the, his next three seasons. Um, his junior year, I think it's either his junior or senior year, he led the conference in tackles that year. It was the first team all Pac-10 um, that year as well, unanimous. So, I, I mean, like, to me, you know, what he uh, embodied um, during his career at Oregon State to me, uh, means more than... Uh, and Reggie did, too. I mean, not to take anything from Reggie Tung. I mean, Reggie Tung was a phenomenal, you know, player as well, too. This is hard, okay? Let me right, just say you that. Know, this well, is hard. we it's talked hard. about this when we were putting this bracket together, that figuring out how many wins guys have, that how yeah. that should factor in, and sure. if that matters yeah. to people. Uh, when Cooks was at Oregon State, you know, I always used to talk about... He went up against Paul Richardson from Colorado, who's now with the Seahawks, right? And I, when people would say, who's a better receiver? I said, it's not even close. It's Brandon Cooks. Like, Richardson is good because Colorado's terrible, and someone has to be good. Yeah. So sometimes these guys that have great stats, you go through and you look, and maybe they, those great stats are impressive, but they didn't ever win. So mm -hmm. it's kind of dependent upon how you, as an individual, place value. Yeah, right. and, and one more thing for, for Nick, and the reason why I, 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 I just, really I'm, just I'm, on, I'm on top of it, I'm on top of it today. <laughs> so one of the things that when Reggie was with uh, Oregon State was that he, he didn't have a lot of talent around him. So uh, you saw the stats, he had a whole bunch of tackles. Well, he had a whole bunch of tackles because no one else was really tackling. When Nick was playing, there was a lot of talent on that defensive. There was a lot of talent on the defensive are you including yourself in that? I am including myself <laughs> okay, in that. Okay, just want to make sure. And, and, and uh, linebacking core, and he still was doing his thing. You know, in one game he had 18 tackles. I think it was in his, uh, his senior year against Cal. So, I mean, like, when you do stuff like that, I mean, it, it, I mean, it plays out. Absolutely. Really. All right, make sure to vote on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash NBCFS Northwest. Jump on.
Coming up next, we're going to be handing out our ingredients to victory. Stick around. Go Beeps is brought to you by Toyota Portland on Broadway. By Buster's Texas Style Barbecue. By Les Schwab, doing the right thing since 1952. And by Sherry's Cafe and Pies, your tailgating headquarters for before, during, and after the game. There was a time when the word neighbor meant a helping hand, dependable people, a trusted handshake. At Point S Tire and Auto, it still does. We live here, proud to be your neighbor and locally owned. Expert help for you and what you drive. The right tires for how and where you drive. Certified technicians to fix things right. And always a solid handshake you can trust. Get to the point. Point S Tire and Auto Service. Expert service. Guaranteed. Only the biggest fans shop at the OSU Beaver Store. Why? They operate with a purpose. Their nonprofit mission is to give back to OSU students. My purchase helps make that happen. Beaver Nation, why would you shop anywhere else? Steve, what are you wearing? I told you to wear a cowboy outfit. I did. Not those cowboys. Besides, why would you wear a football uniform for Buster's commercial? It's football season, Buster. So? Nothing makes people hungrier for delicious and tender hand-rubbed, slow-smoked Texas-style barbecue than hard-hitting pigskin action. Pigskin action? Buster's baby back, spare ribs, pulled pork, and links. That does sound good. Tell them where to go. Buster's barbecue. But a lot better than last week. We born to follow. One of the first things we do as parents is hold our kids' hands when crossing the street. So, think of the internet as the world's busiest street. Get online with your children and pay attention to what they're clicking on. Teach them to surf and post responsibly and encourage them to talk to you about what and who they encounter. They'll soon be old enough to navigate safely by themselves, all because they had a dedicated crossing guard. The more you know. Go Beavs is brought to you by Toyota. Let's go places. Oregon State looking for their first Pac-12 win of the season tomorrow afternoon at USC. Man, but the Beavers have some uh, challenging injuries as well. Here's a look at the injury list. Xavier Crawford is out. Obviously, Jake Luton. you got Dwayne Williams out for the remainder of the season. Uh, doubtful, Ryan Reynal, Jay Irvine, Kessie Ahoy uh, out. Uh, probably, sorry, doubtful as well. Uh, time now for our ingredients to victory, brought to you by Papa John's. And if the Beavers score a touchdown in the game, you win the following Tuesday with Touchdown Tuesday. Just use the promo, promo code PEAVER7 for 50% off your online order. Jason, what are your ingredients to victory? Okay, so I kind of talked about this a little earlier. But one of the things I think that they have to do is take advantage of the, um, the offensive line and injuries that they have for USC. There's two names that I, I want to point out in particular that are going to be key to this game. You know, one of the names is uh, Andrew Voorhees. He's the freshman that's taking over as the right guard for USC. And the other name is Clayton Johnson. Who, he's a redshirt sophomore. So if they're able to maximize and take advantage of those guys and pressure the quarterback and stop the run, it's going to be a good day for the, um, for the defense. My second key ingredient is that you have to be able to play with reckless abandon. I love that. Offensively and defensively. <laughs> that's great. Make a mistake going 100%. Exactly. We talked about that yep. before. All right, Lindsay. Uh, how about let's put together a full game. Can they play four quarters? We've seen halves pretty regularly. Haven't seen a second half yet, kind of at all. So I think that that will be huge, putting together all four quarters. And then again, I said this last week, and I, I think it's part of the reason they were in the game. 
no turnovers, no turnovers, no turnovers, no turnovers. Against a team as talented as SC, you turn the ball over, you're going to feel the effects okay. of that almost immediately. And I feel like it's such coach speak to be like, you win the turnover battle, you win the game. But it feels like in this case, like we said. You know what else? We, we didn't bring this up, but time of possession has been killing Oregon State yeah. this year. And against a team like SC that does not run a hurry-up type situation, time of possession, I think, will be even more important. So this that would be huge for them. Yeah. So no turnovers. Capitalize. On those, on those uh, yeah. Darnold turnovers, yeah. if he makes them, pressure, yeah. and right? Let the, let the defense rest. Like, move the ball so that the defense can rest so they can regroup. All right. Lots of good points. Thanks for joining us tonight. We will see you back here for Talking Beavers next Wednesday at 7 p.m. We'll have all the action from the USC-Oregon State game.